every week thousands are drawn to Miami's aging Seaquarium for a spectacular encounter with a majestic creature of the deep. And today, the leader of the orca is putting on another awe-inspiring show. This is one of the few places in the world where you can see the interaction between an orca and its human trainer. Remarkably, Lolita has been repeating this performance up to three times a day for the past 43 years. The crowds might adore her, but Lolita's confinement is highly controversial. Inside the Seaquarium, animal rights activists have stepped up their efforts in their decades-long campaign to set Lolita free. This animal at the Seaquarium was kidnapped, and that's the only way to describe it. This animal was kidnapped, taken against her will, onto a struggle of life and death. This animal, Lolita, has been living in this little chlorinated cement prison for more than 40 years. That's a trained behavior that looks spectacular to the audience and it, it tells you nothing about what orcas are in the wild. Samantha Witchcraft doesn't go inside the Seaquarium because as one of the leaders of the protest movement, she's not welcome there. But she's horrified that orcas so used to a life in the wild are being so ruthlessly exploited in captivity. What you see in this footage, that entire enclosure is her entire tank. It is shallower than she is long. So she cannot dive in this tank. And what orcas do in the wild is they dive very deep and they fish very deep and they swim very deep. And she can't do that because the tank is shallower than she is long. It's a travesty. It was August 1970 when Lolita and her family pod of more than 100 killer whales were moving through the waters of the Puget Sound off the coast of Washington State. As the pod moved through an inlet known as Penn Cove, a team of orca hunters sprang upon them. It was horrendous. It was a terror operation. They threw bombs into the water. They herded them with every kind of speedboat and aircraft they possibly could and got them into a dead end cul-de-sac where they could not escape. But this old town, I mean, it's... Howard Garrett lives near Penn Cove and has been campaigning for Lolita's release for almost three decades. He says locals regard the capture as the most traumatic event here in living memory. First, they drew the seine nets, the fishing nets, all the way across so that there was no escape. Then they built the corrals inside and herded the, the mothers with the young ones into the inside corral and then they separated the mamas from the babies, pushed the mamas out. But they were agitated, they were traumatized, they were making noise. People were hearing the calls of the whales all around this entire neighborhood. John Crow was just 18 when he was hired to help with the capture. More than 40 years later, it remains the worst experience of his life. They're all lined up, like 30 whales, uh, 25, 30 feet maybe, behind us in 10 feet of water probably, all talking to Lolita. And they're just looking straight at us, just out seeing what's going on, you know. And I lost it, and I just start bawling, and then my, my kids have never seen me cry. We got the job done, but uh, man, that was more than I could handle. In the frenzy that followed, four young orcas died after charging the nets. But their deaths were kept a secret. Peter and Brian filled their bellies with rocks and tied anchors around their tails and sank them. Three months later, these carcasses float up onto the beach with all these wealthy people around. 
and uh, the cat was out of the bag. Awesome. It was the testimony of John Crow and others to a Washington State inquiry that led to the introduction of America's Marine Mammals Protection Act and the outlawing of orca captures in US waters. All too late for Lolita. They're called killer whales, but in fact, they're not whales at all. They're actually dolphins, the largest member of the dolphin family. Orcas are extremely intelligent with highly evolved communication skills and a behavioral culture that has no parallel apart from humans. But it's their sophisticated social bonding that's their most remarkable characteristic along with the complex matriarchal societies to which they belong, roaming the oceans in closely knit family pods. The orca is the most social animal on planet Earth. When they get together, they get together for life. We get together for birthdays and Christmas and stuff. They get together for life and they live in a world of sound. So when we capture them like Lolita, we take away from them the two most important aspects of their life, the world of sound and their family. As the Miami Seaquarium's head trainer in the 1960s, Rick O'Barry achieved fame by coaching the dolphins that were used in the TV series Flipper. But it was his first-hand experience with a captive orca that left him deeply troubled about the mental impact of confinement. I trained the first killer whale in captivity uh, in the eastern United States. His name was Hugo at the Miami Seaquarium. He was captured at a very young age, very violent capture. He never adjusted to captivity. Hugo was extremely bored. He would come across the tank and crash his head into the side of the tank and the whole tank would sh shake, concrete and steel and glass. And, and, and eventually he died of a brain aneurysm from banging his head against the tank. Then they got another one, Lolita. What you don't see is the real show, which goes on between shows. You would see Lolita's head up against the tank of just, it's, it's captive dolphin depression syndrome. It's a catatonic state that they go into because you're dealing with a large brain that's in this bathtub basically. They become psychotic, I believe. I believe Lolita's psychotic. But the audience doesn't know that. They're dealing with an optical illusion. Hi, everybody. We're the Johnsons from Detroit, Michigan. We sure had a great time when we visited SeaWorld. It's one of our favorite places. When the whales get close to the glass and start kicking up the water, whammo, you're a goner. <laughs> I fail to see how a trainer popping up out of the water on the rodstrom or on the back of an orca tells you anything educational or anything in terms of conservation about these animals. It's a circus trick. It's like seeing the lady in the feathers riding the elephant in the circus. Orange County Sheriff's Office. We need SO to respond for a dead person at SeaWorld. Uh, a whale has eaten one of the trainers. A whale ate one of the trainers? That's correct. Blackfish is the title of a new documentary which is set to lift the debate about orcas in captivity to a new level. It tells the story of the death of Dawn Brancho, an orca trainer at SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida. Coming out here every day and having the audience just love what we're doing with the animals. How do I make this animal as beautiful as they are and, and have people walk away loving this animal and they're touched and they're moved and I feel like I made a difference to them. I left in January of 2010. The documentary includes interviews with several experienced SeaWorld trainers and probes the background of an orca named Tilikum, the star attraction of SeaWorld which fatally attacked Dawn. 
When you watch the whole video, you can see that Tilikum is actually really with Don in the beginning of the video. Tilikum's performance begins correctly as he does what's called a peck wave, swimming around the edge of the pool with one of his flippers raised. Dawn blows a whistle to let him know that he's done well and it's time for a reward. But it seems Tilikum misses the cue and does another lap. Dawn punishes him by delaying the fish reward and Tilikum can tell that her bucket is nearly empty. As Dawn enters the pool, Tilikum follows and then drags her under. Out of respect for her family, the documentary does not show the horrifying death that follows. It may have started as play or frustration and uh, clearly escalated to be you know, very violent behavior that I think was anything but play. In the end, you know, he basically just completely mutilated that poor girl. I heard about the death of Don Brancho and um, thought I would be doing a documentary on essentially this one sort of tragic event. And then slowly started peeling back the onion and realizing that um, there were so, so many things and truths that shocked me. Gabriella Copperthwaite is the director of Blackfish. Her film traces Tillicum's life in captivity and suggests that his confinement has made him psychotic. I mean, it's just one of those sad things. We'll never really know why Tillicum made the decision he did. And so, in a way, at the end, I kind of wanted to just understand him and understand why he did what, what he did. And, and I, think, I think we understand that his life in captivity kind of led him to make the decisions that he did. In theory, orcas in captivity are protected by regulations outlawing animal cruelty. It's the job of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, the AZA, to monitor animal welfare. What I've learned actually rather recently is that the AZA um, is, you know, comprised of, of different aquariums and zoos. And if a zoo's not doing it right, everybody in the AZA gets to sort of vote and just sort of say, this uh, zoo is not doing right by their bears or their elephants. When it comes to killer whales, there's one expert in the room, SeaWorld. So SeaWorld has essentially for decades been running unchecked, been governing themselves, and, uh, and I think that's why we've, we have the problem that we do today. Following an inquiry into Brancho's death, SeaWorld has been banned from allowing its trainers to enter the orca tanks to perform. But that legal ruling does not apply to the Miami Seaquarium and Lolita. I think Lolita definitely tugs at everybody's heartstrings because um, her mother is there in the Puget Sound and they actually recognize each other's vocalizations. And uh, how amazing would it be to, after all these decades to put Lolita back with her original pod. If Lolita gets her chance of freedom and a family reunion with her pod, then it will take place here in the waters surrounding San Juan Island in the Pacific Northwest, famous for its numerous pods of resident orcas. Yeah, this is our nautical chart. Uh, we've just left Snug Harbor. We're heading out to the Harrow Strait and the whales are down south of us here about seven miles. No one in the world knows more about Lolita's family than marine biologist Ken Balcom. We're on our way to track down a pod of orcas that was sighted earlier in the day. A family of killer whales Ken has named J-Pod. There you go. This may happen again. <laughs> I'm just shooting thin profile just to see who all is in the group. This is kind of how we do social organization studies. Yeah. A pod that swims together stays together. The encounter with J-Pod has special significance. 
These whales are amongst Lolita's closest relatives. This uh, pod of whales going by here, they're very close relatives. This is J-Pod, Lolita is from L-Pod, but they're all cousins. J-Pod is the largest of the resident killer whale pods in the Puget Sound, which continues to be led by its elderly matriarch, an orca known as J-2. J-2's estimated about 100 years old. Goodness. She's been post-reproductive for the entire time of our study and probably for 20 years before that. While the owner of the Miami Seaquarium has no intention of letting Lolita go, Ken Balcom has already worked out exactly how and where it should happen, right nearby to where this pot of orcas are feeding. Well, I hope to see just exactly this, uh, Lolita's relatives swimming by back and forth in front of the cove that we have Lolita, and I'm sure they will vocalize and be in communication. She would be here no more than about a month and a half and then the gate would be open and and just start exercising just up and down the west side of the island through all the salmon and uh, eventually be free to come into a, a bay or a feeding station if she wanted to but if she would rather she can just keep swimming outside although ken's plans for lolita's release and family reunion may appear little more than a flight of fancy there is already a very real team of lawyers committed to making this fairy tale come true. I would actually hope that for Lolita that we should have answers this coming year, at least answers that will be appealed by one side or the other. But the case that the Animal Legal Defense Fund filed on Lolita's behalf first started in 2011, so at least we're, we're down that path a little bit. We're still Lawyers are trying to have the conditions her, under which Lolita is kept declared illegal and argue that with a tangible family connection to her pod, her immediate return to the Puget Sound is essential. So here we are, Kanaka <laughs> Bay, Lolita's new home. Ken and Howard have taken me to the place they've chosen as Lolita's temporary sea pen. Orcas have very, very large brains, about four and a half times the size of human brains, which is a lot of associational cortex, a lot of storage area, a lot of hard drive. So she's able to draw from those recollections and remember just the feel, the familiarity of this place. Uh, and I, I think it'll, it'll, come, it'll come back to her. In the sanctuary of the cove, it's hoped that Lolita will quickly reacquaint herself with the rhythms and sounds of the ocean. With her relatives swimming outside, a family reunion would be just a matter of time. While she's in captivity, Lolita makes a fortune for her owners. But for the rest of us, the symbolism of her release would be priceless. We live by the, the stories that we make and that we tell. And this story is about reuniting nature and, and re, uh, re reassembling the, the nature that we have ripped apart and allowing it to, to flourish without our domination and our control and our exploitation. So it's just going to be a, a beautiful thing to see and for people to, to uh, enjoy and, and feel a part of.